Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last of the fall webinars presented by the North American Cambridge Classics Project and underwritten by Cambridge University Press. Uh, on a side note, uh, this year we started a monthly virtual discussion group, uh, CLC-TLC, and it's a discussion group that's a great way to get your individual questions answered and uh, just talk with some fellow Latin teachers about any topic that's of interest to you. Uh, the next session is going to be next week on November the 30th, and then we're going to do another one on December the 14th. Uh, Sammy Smith and Stephanie Spaulding are your hosts for this uh, discussion group. Uh, Jenny Blasi and I, Martha Altieri, are really pleased to welcome this evening Nora Kelly and Sammy Smith as our guest presenters. Uh, both of these ladies have done a number of webinars for us, as well as been presenters at our summer workshops. Uh, Nora has taught all levels of Latin, including AP and IB, and she teaches at Washington Lee High School in Arlington, Virginia. Sammy teaches at the Dalton School in New York City, and in addition to Latin, Sammy has also taught English, philosophy, and Greek. And we are just thrilled to have both of them this evening talk about vocabulary in context. This webinar is being recorded. The link will be posted in a few days on the NACCP website, which is cambridgelatin.org. And if you need a professional development certificate for this evening's presentation, if you will just email us at training at cambridgelatin.org, I'll get the certificate out to you uh, in a day or so. So um, welcome everybody and um, welcome to Nora and Sammy and vocabulary and context. All right, great. I will, let's see. Oh. It disappeared. No, there it is. Yay, it worked. Alrighty. Hello, welcome to everyone. Um, your first thing that we will begin is um, to talk about the grounding, the foundations of the course. Since this is Cambridge Latin, um, we're going to start you off with a little bit of reminder about um, why we're doing what we're doing and um, to pass it along into your classroom so that it can be particularly helpful for you when you're thinking about um, why vocabulary is um, not a means to an end, but that um, everything should always revolve around reading. So I have a, a few excerpts from the teacher's manual. This is from the fifth edition, and this is from the uh, unit one, fifth edition teacher's manual. And just as a reminder that we're always thinking about reading and its connection to Roman civilization, and that it's the language that we're um, particularly interested in having students develop and master and become lifelong readers of Latin. Great. Should I go to the next one? Okay. Great. <clears throat> so um, how do we do this? We're thinking about vocabulary and if you were tired of flashcards and the endless checklists and quizzes and you find that your students cram and forget, perhaps some of these things will help you. And perhaps your students will find that the whole function of vocabulary is about um, helping them read. And the more they're interested in reading, um, the more engaged they are in your class. So we want to keep, again, language and culture connected as we go through reading and pique our students' interests. Go ahead, Nora. Okay. Thanks. So. According to CLC, again, um, this is in the unit one teacher's manual, vocabulary is best acquired through attentive reading and oral work in class. And Nora and I are going to walk you through a host of ways that you can do this. Before we dive into the activities, we're just going to have um, a little bit of background from our unofficial sponsor, Stephen Krashen. Next. Yeah. Okay. There he is. Um, okay, and so here's a quote from Stephen Krashen. Language learning is about knowing how to do it and staying with it. Anybody can do it. Um, and I really liked this quote because, you know, I'm sure you all have this with students, right? Oh, I can't do it. I'm not good at Latin. But honestly, anybody can do it. 
it, it really just is a question of staying with it. And then from my perspective, I feel like it's a question of making it fun. If they're having fun, they won't realize that they're sticking with it. They'll just be having fun. Oh, good. So right. Stephen and, Fashion is going to give us a little um, bite-sized bit about vocabulary in his world. All right, here we go. Stories dominates this approach. <clears throat> in the last 10 years or so, I have learned to appreciate the incredible power of fiction. Fiction is the name of the game. The first stage we go through, stories, stories, stories. We hear stories from mommy and daddy. We get stories in school. Kids who hear more stories do better in school. Stories give us everything. And stories leads to reading, of course. Kids who hear more stories, want to hear, want to read books on their own. Uh, I, well, being middle class and growing up in a very privileged environment, people like me who have all these privileges need to tell people about it. I can't take credit for it. A famous football coach said, excuse me for speaking the language of American baseball, some people are born on third base and they spend their whole life thinking they hit a triple. And on second base, I had every advantage. It was all given. Books all around. Mommy and daddy were readers. The house was filled with books. My sister was a reader, still is. When I was nine years old, my sister took me to the local Chicago Public Library and got me a library card. That's the kind of environment I had. My father allowed me to read all the comic books I wanted to. And he said, I'll pay for them. This is great. That's the kind of advantage I had. Okay, we have to make sure we agree. Our job is to make sure every child has these advantages. Okay, second language, uh, Benico has invented a technique called story listening. In her class in English as a foreign language, uh, she tells stories. She, she takes them from Grimm's fairy tales, which is great because these are things that have stood the, twist, twist, uh, the test of time. Everybody likes them. They're excellent. They're powerful. And we don't have to spend money on creating them, et cetera. They're free to download all this. When she prepares it in advance, when she thinks there's a word the students may not know, real interesting research coming up here, she then will draw a picture maybe give a synonym in Japanese, maybe give more explanation. This is called having a prompter and, you know, giving them comprehension, aiding supplementation. In one experiment, she did the work. I got the credit for it. I was co-author. It's a good way of working. Anyway, what she did was we compared it with what happens when you give people you supplement this with formal vocabulary exercises. We're always tempted to do that. She found that you're better off listening to another story. It's not as efficient as just listening. Vocabulary goes better when you just tell the story. Don't tell kids to memorize the words, write them down, listen to the story and enjoy. You get more words per minute than if you do vocabulary exercises or you combine them. So this is really a wonderful result. Yeah. Okay, and so that's the end of his quote, which is awesome because Cambridge has such a wonderful storyline going through all four books. And, you know, when I, when I talk with my other colleagues in my school and their Spanish and French teachers, they all have these separate units about, you know, the doctor's office, the dinner table. Um, but the cool thing about Cambridge is it has that story and I feel like, especially at the high school level, kids don't get stories as much as they did in the elementary and also in the middle school level, they don't. So they lap it up. It's... Ah. Stories no, no, no. dominates. This. There we go. So in addition to Stephen Krashen, um, and he spends a lot of time talking about um, stories, about fiction, the value of aesthetic, um, reading, but any kind of reading is so, so important. So whatever you can do to get your kids with books in their hand and excited about reading, um, the better off their vocabulary is going to be. Forget the lists, forget the memorization, just expose them. And so this reading volume, as Palaming says, is one of the single most things to 
improve vocabulary. So let's talk about assessment, something near and dear to my heart. This does not mean that you have to record a grade on everything. And I hope that as we go through, you're thinking as much about the feedback that you have on your own teaching as you are about the kind of feedback you're giving to your students. And the thing that I want my students to walk away from my class, the best feedback they can give me is that 10 years later, they say, I've been reading such and such in Latin and I just wanted you to know. I want them to be lifelong readers. If your kids are not saying how much they like reading in Latin, figure out ways that you can get them hooked into the storyline. Fewer quizzes, fewer traditional notions, and those are fine. I'm, I'm in a school that still expects me to do all of those things, but think about other ways that you can pull kids in so that those unmeasurable objectives become your single biggest factor of what you're assessing. Um, and then I put vocabulary at the top, but it's small. It feeds into reading comprehension, and that's the goal of what we're about. And if you're interested in any of my objectives, I'm happy to share them. Um, I keep changing them year after year. Um, but one of the most important things I feel is to do something with the words. Um, and that's what makes the students really own them. And there's just a wealth of materials from Cambridge and out there on the internet and um, things that you can see. I'm always finding new things and tweaking them in some other way. Um, so the, um, let's see, the end, I always get it wrong. The North American Cambridge Classics Pro Project has derivative worksheets that are, oh, and there it is right there, um, that are, you know, super fun and the kids really enjoy them. So we included a link there to their resources page. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, one of the things that I do that I learned from another teacher is you can take any story, kind of read through it and find categories of words that kind of repeat. And the kids love going through to see if they can find the 10 words that have to do with emotion. Um, and then it's fun to have them come up with their own categories too, because they think of things that I wouldn't have. And we'll talk about the vocab cube, which I love in a second. So going back to ye old teacher's manual, um, if you take a peek, you will find at the end of most stages, there's a little, a bit of a vocabulary checklist that has some kind of derivative information. And I love this because it gives you an opportunity, if you want to do a do now, you can put one or two of these things at the end of an assignment or a little quiz. Um, and the kids like reading them. They like to know how those words are broken apart and words that they probably haven't thought of. Primus plus capio equals princeps or sacer plus do equals sacer dos. Um, I, I think they're fun too. And they're always good reminders. Righty. Oh, right. So there's the vocab cube for those of you who might not have seen it. Um, and it's also on that NAC NACCP site. But um, so what you do with this thing, and there's one for each stage, is the Latin is on one side, the English is on the other. The students cut these up. So they end up being a bunch of little squares. And then they put them together again as a puzzle. Um, I often have students work in pairs. You can have them sort of commit, sorry, compete who finishes first. Um, but the important thing I think is to do it at the end of the stage when they've seen a lot of these words already, or even to go back to previous stages. You know, this is a perfect thing to pull out when, um, you know, some student finishes early and wants something else to work on. Um, I, and they're very relaxing. Like for me, I put the little fireplace up on the smart board and, you know, and it's nice. And my students like to use them like um, like a deck of cards. So they draw and they choose one of the words and they um, try to figure out uh, what it is. Um, and then they play it like a, a card game, which is kind of fun too. Oh, wow. Okay. I'd like to try that. So tiered reading. Um, so, many examples of <laughs> so many examples of tiered reading. Um, Come here. First and easiest. Perhaps we can have, Sammy, perhaps we can have everybody mute themselves except for you guys. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, so many examples. I think one of the easiest and uh, most ready examples is Fabula Mirabilis. 
Um, in unit one, which is the werewolf story, um, you can go visit this during Halloween. My students read the unit one and then they re, um, having reread Fabula Marabolis, then they stepped into some Petronius. Um, and it's nice to get that storyline to give them an opportunity to feel like they own something. And there are lots of examples like this scattered throughout. Um, and not just in Cambridge, but you can uh, go toward a host of other examples where students get these kind of modified adapted stories before they read the real thing. And they're seeing that vocabulary in the context again and again. Okay. Um, before COVID, I used to get a huge sheet of paper and I would ask for a student volunteer um, to lie down on this huge sheet of paper and we would trace out the student's body in kind of like a, I don't know, like a police, <laughs> police zone, like a dead body zone, whatever. Um, they love doing it. One student would trace uh, another student's body and um, it was all very safe and friendly, um, but with COVID, I now hand out little gingerbread um, people um, and I always have a heart. Um, and then I have different pieces of the gingerbread person labeled. So maybe you want to trace a character's development or maybe you're just digging into a character and you want to know what's going on inside, let's say Wilby's head or Modesto's head. So um, you talk about what's in their men's or you say, what, what is it that they see? What's, um, what is in their okuli or what, kind of weight do they have on their umarus, their umari, what's in their core, um, what do they want to leave behind that would be in their sinistra, their left hand, what are they really interested in holding on to, that would be a definite salvius, like I have to get more power kind of move, and um, what's their Achilles heel, their planta Achilles, so um, kids like doing these, and they can refer back to them, and it helps them logically not only keep track of characters, but you can have them practice with words in Latin and with words in English as they go through. They're super fun. And the buy-in to the characters is so important. The, um, the forms of words, I think, um, is the way that this is presented when students first learn participles. I think this is one of the best ways for, um, for students to see, look, you already know this word. And here's a new form, laudawit, um, directly underneath, laudatus, we tuperawit, directly underneath, we tuperatus. If you point out the way that the book has structured these words and that they're already familiar with them, um, it becomes a really easy way for them to know, oh yeah, I already own this vocabulary word. It just has a little bit of shift in the way that I'm going to be translating it now. And I often go back to, I do it a lot, go back to the older model sentences and review them again, do them in different ways. And this one in particular, I always revisit when I'm in stage 31. So when they start that ablet of absolute, we go back to this and it just helps them. Oh, I'm, yeah, I, the same thing. I'm very familiar with this. And then they can see how it goes, you know, the same construction pretty much in the ablet of. Um, so the model sentences are not just a one-time thing. Um, okay, and so um, and so again, as had been mentioned earlier, read, 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 and and quick things. You know, you can fit something really quick, a little five-minute thing at the beginning of class, and we just put a bunch of links here for some things that might be interested interesting. Um, you should definitely, if you don't, if you haven't done it already, check out the Latin Wikipedia because you can search Taylor Swift and all these other things, and there are articles about them on there in Latin. Um, a lot of the mythology and, you know, I had some kids who were, um, gosh, what is it? They're reading about Stalin. So they wanted, so we read about Stalin on Wikipedia. Um, it gets them very involved. This one you might find interesting. Um, this is a, somebody who writes a blog about his summer vacations and trips to Maine. Um, the Fabulae Mirabiles are great, they're fairy tales in Latin, um, but they're wonderful for all of those ut clauses and, um, you know, result clauses and indirect questions. They have a ton of them in the context of Rapunzel. Um, and Fabulae Antiquae mythology, I think I put links to um, Amazon here. 
um, but very simple. So it's good for Latin one. But we did want to click on this one, which I hope will open. Good. I know. So you can see I don't have a lot of faith. Um, so this is Laura Gibbs' site, and it's just packed with stuff. The little Latin LOL cats, just a little thing like that. You could have it on the board. Um, she's always, she's got a little, um, a lot of um, Aesop's fables. And I'm trying to find, there's a thing where she has the free, she has all of these books and she has free versions of them. And now I'm not able to find them. Isn't that funny? It was here before. Um, I won't go clicking on everything. Oh, maybe it disappeared. There we go. So she's written Aesop's fables in Latin, um, you know, a thousand fables in one, short little things, and Latin via Proverbs, which is awesome because it's arranged by uh, grammatical topics. So you can go find all of the passives in Proverbs. Um, and if you click on this thing, you'll find free PDFs of all of those things. So um, I use them a lot. And, you know, just a quick little thing at the beginning of class, because then what will happen is you'll go on to read your story in Cambridge and they'll see some word that was in that thing and they'll say, oh my gosh, we just saw that. So um, I really recommend doing it. The kids love it, it's a lot of fun. If you're looking for a way to explain vocabulary and context, look no further than close reading exercise. I love using these not only because you can push through a story quite quickly, but it is the easiest way to remind students about words that you know that they've been struggling with. You just pull them out of the text and you make them rely on the translation that you've provided them for context in order to figure out the rest of the words. Um, you can be super nice and give them um, several blanks, often like having been, you know, whatever, um, for the uh, third part, if you're doing, you know, perfect passive participle in a very kind of rote kind of way, or you can just give a really long blank and give some fluidity in the way that you um, do your translation. But my students really like these. They feel like they have ownership of the text and it does help them remember vocabulary within the context of reading. Um, and if you're wondering why we have so many um, activities on reading, um, definitely the Cambridge, Cambridge way. There are um, many others that we're heading up in just a sec. Yeah, but reading definitely comes first. The reading drives the vocabulary. Um, and I was doing a number of these this week in my classes. And I have one class in which um, the students aren't particularly motivated and this they would do. They would stick with this thing and because there's something compelling about filling in those blanks. Um, so they can, they can be great. Um, they're filling in the blanks with the English looking at the Latin story. So you, you have the Cambridge Latin story. I'm looking at the chat now um, and they add in the English. Um, and then listening is very important too, because you want to get everything from different modalities, right? So a dictatio is a very simple, you're, they've got a piece of paper, you're reading the Latin, um, you know, don't make it too long, kind of a smallish paragraph. But usually what I do is I read through moderately slowly um, and tell them to leave lacunae and they freak out, but you know, it's okay. They leave the spots because they can start to put it together when they look, oh, it's gotta be that word. Then you read a second time and by the third time they have everything. Um, but a lot of it has also been them figuring out what should fit in the blank just on their own. Um, and then the Cambridge videos, which are so awesome because often they're so bad, they're good, right? So the kids love them. Um, and of course, this is the all time favorite. It was hard to pause it at the right place, but the one with the bear, you know, and then he, I think he punches Dumnorix and Salvius does nothing. So definitely make use of those. I always, they, you know, I always use those. Here's a nice link to Magister Craft, who many people know about, but, you know, he's great and he has all of these Minecraft videos, which the kids are really into, um, with Latin subtitles. And even though they're a pretty simple level, they're still useful for the upper levels um, of Latin. They'll get a vocab word out of that. Um, the Latinitium is really cool. It's a little more complicated, but the nice thing about that is it can show the students, you can listen to this thing and only understand 70% and that's okay. Cause that's how it's going to work as you move into the more, you know, uh, authentic Latin. So, and he has a, such a great voice. And I also think that it's one of the nice pieces um, to remind students when they go see a Shakespearean play. 
how much of the Shakespearean play do you understand first pass through? And that's all we want students to do, to sink in, be comfortable um, getting the gist of something. Yeah. Um, and that was that's true for, I think, a lot of us. Um, and you can also toggle the um, subtitles, of course, with Elevate and with Maggie Sturcraft's work. Um, you can do Latin, no subtitles, um, or English with Maggie Sturcraft. Um, if you have not taken advantage of the attainment tests in Cambridge Elevate, this is a perfect time to start thinking about when you can use them. Um, you read the story aloud to the students. They hear your dynamic reading. Your dynamic reading can help them think about vocabulary in the context of the story that they might not have gotten if they read it only to themselves. So you read it aloud, then they read it again. And having that opportunity for reading and rereading, um, I think slows students down and gives them an opportunity to wrestle with language. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay. Um, so Nora, I'm gonna have you drag things around. Okay. My, students yeah, love, yeah. my students love this. So um, I'll say, um, ubi est, um, ubi est anum, ubi est anum. And, uh, oh. Yep. And so they'll. Wait, oh no. Oh no. Toto, come back. You might have to um, exit out. Um, oh, okay. Okay. This is going to require skill. Um, <laughs> yep. So you just drag I the word. Did it. You did okay, it exactly. And um, it doesn't, you know, if they put it on the horse, then we would do a stop and check. Um, I do this often on Google Jam boards. You can do it in just about any, uh, you could do it in. Um, Pear deck, you can do it in a lot of different things. And it's a nice way after you've read through the model sentences, you just take a picture of the um, pictures and um, some words that you really want to hit. And um, you have like, what does bala would mean? And the students love saying that word and laugh and laugh um, when they drag things over. It's like, oh, it looks like a little speech bubble. I have one student who always likes to, the, the word uh, diadema is over the queen's face. She likes to cover up faces with words. So um, there you have it um, in honor of her. It's and it's a cool way, as you said, to revisit the model sentences because they're supposed to be read again and again. And you know, often the students are like, we already read these. So it's another way to do it. And they're sneakily reading them. Yeah. Right. Reading the picture. Um, so as we just said, the model sentences really aren't a one-time shot. It's really good to reread them again quickly, go back to older ones, get the students used to the fact that, um, you know, that they're not an Agatha Christie murder mystery. You can read them again and again, even if you know the answer. Um, and then I won't do the backwards build, but if you, if you're familiar with Rossius, it's really a good approach. Um, and it can be a nice quick exercise to do in class, but essentially what you do is you kind of, you have the whole class there and you read, you start from the back of the sentence. This one might actually be a little long. Um, and you would say like pontem transire noluit, and then you snap for attention. You're not snapping at the student. And then you sort of like gesture at a student and they have to repeat, but it's a low pressure thing. It's pretty easy to just do those three words. And then you add the, a word back and add a word back. Um, and then you can start to substitute other words and then that's a way to get them to play with the meanings of the words um, while they're hearing it and saying it. Um, but no, air, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you said that you can watch uh, examples on YouTube um, just for practice as well. Yeah, there's a, a ton of them out there. Um, and I, the airplane readings I really like, this is from Keith Toda's site who we have linked later. But basically you've got students sitting face to face and the, 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 the wise move. So they're face to face. And then one student might read a Latin sentence, number, you know, X student, Y student gives the meaning in English, then reads the next Latin sentence in a story. So you just have your Cambridge book right there, kind of goes back and forth for a while. And then you say, moete say, and they all shift down one column so that students are opposite different students, you know, and different levels are matched against each other. And um, if there's an odd number of students in the class, then I get to sit. And that's nice too, because I can have, I can, you know, read with the students. And you can also do it just having them read through the Latin really quickly without any sort of translating. And it can be a good way to sort of pre-read um, the stories. 
And then, you know, you can also use the model sentences with asking, circling with questions, quiz S in Pictura. So there's a, there are a lot of different ways that you can get them to repeat that won't put them on the spot. Okay, um, I have done several iterations of movie talks. This is the shortest one, and um, this is why I put it in here. This is the whole script. Um, sometimes I will do it. Sometimes I'll ask for a student or two to help me, and um, I'll just walk them through what it looks like. So um, if you, this is a little gif of Buster Keaton and some guy in a lion suit, um, but it's the story of Pastor Leo only, um, Leo gets a manicure. And so I build in little conversational pieces. I often ask my students, Quidagas, Udwales, um, as they come in. And so they're getting um, my little conversational bits that we do in class and um, a repetition of what's going to happen, either a preview in the story or as a follow up in the story. How is this story of the shepherd and the lion different than, um, than the one in the book? Eek. There we go. So um, uh, if, you, if you just want to uh, play the first, I'll just walk you through a, a couple of lines. Um, so if you click on the GIF. The oh, OK, cool. Come up. Come on, Buster. <laughs> come on, Buster. All right, Hit there it. we go. So click again. OK. It's very short. It's like two minutes of your, less than two minutes of your time. So it turns around and um, this is our introduction. And so you can cut this if you want. This might give your students a little bit of grounding to the story. And then he looks over, he says, Solway Leo Utuales. And he looks at his paws and he says, Ah, hey you. And so it goes on and on. And you just read the lines. And there are a number of ways that you can do movie talks. Um, this is the way that I like to do it. I like to write a little script as if I'm one of the characters. So um, we don't have to watch the whole thing. But again, it does not take a long time. You can, um, you can watch it a couple of times and it really won't have killed your class period. And I have kids who always want to volunteer. I'll read with you, I'll read with you. And then when they get to that line in the story later, when they're reading, they're like, oh, it's my line. I know that word um, where they might not have known it before. And they will always pay attention to a video. And, <laughs> yeah. and it's cool for them to see something from that long ago. Okay. So, um, if you're wondering how you do vocabulary with older students, students who are transitioning out of Cambridge into unadapted Latin, um, when we get to stage 36, for example, with Marshall, um, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to read aloud, read aloud, read aloud, reread, uh, um, especially with poetry, because students get the opportunity to hear the music of the line. They can hear where there are longs and shorts, um, and scansion becomes super, super easy. They um, intuit what's happening as they do their recitatios. And one of the extension activities I like to do with Marshall is um, they just list a bunch of words that um, they think are particularly funny. And then we get into an insult circle and um, I will often put myself in the circle so it spares the kids. I'm like, okay, throw some insults at me. Tell me I have a face underwater. Tell me that I am an undertaker, right? And so they're like, Westpilo or you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But they're thinking again of the words that they just encountered in Marshall. And those nice little pithy um, epigrams are super fun for students to feel like I own this language. And the way, again, that Cambridge sets it up by um, those noun adjective pairs um, helps isolate that vocabulary in a, in a super facile way. Okay. Um, okay, and then creating stuff also is important. And there are so many different ways you can do it. Um, this one I did recently, actually, with my IB, my upper level students, um, with the puffy verbs, because, you know, they always forget them. And I thought, okay, let's do them. So, you know, we put them up on the board, we talked about what they meant. And then I would point to I picked two, they had to integrate the two and make a story. And then this one, they did three. And then in the end, I had them do all five. Um, and they had so much fun with it. Um, so, and I forget exactly how this works, but I guess this guy is enjoying singing or something. Um, 
and I'm not sure what they're using. And then I guess the table is functioning as something and they have a disco ball. Um, and then they had somebody vomiting on the side. And um, and as I was telling Sammy, when I looked at Slater, I thought, wait, are those jello shots? They might be jello shots. Um, but <laughs> they they had so much fun with it. And then the other ones, there was one group that kept featuring Barney, the purple dinosaur throughout it. So, you know, it was sort of nostalgic for them too, I think. Um, and it doesn't take that long. So there's a million things you can do with whiteboards. That, the whiteboards were the best investment I ever made. Um, and they can all, you can also have them build a story. And you know the Jenga thing, I'll, is, I'll be super quick. It's very time consuming, but it's a good thing to do. Like I will probably do it next Monday or Tuesday when half the kids are out for Thanksgiving and the others have been left behind. Um, but it helps them relax and work together. And then basically, you know, whatever number they get will correspond to a number that you've written on the board. And they write a sentence with that as a group and then go to the next one and they build a little story and you share them at the end. Um, and, you know, Jenga has 48 things. So I would, I would have like eight words maybe and then just keep repeating them. Um, not 48 words, too many. Um, Latin Scrabble, you can use a Scrabble board, basically. And then I just, Latin words count triple, regular words count just once. And then I have a lot of Spanish speaking students in one of my classes, so those count double. Um, and then you just give them the Cambridge textbook and then they're running through it, trying to find words that start with S and it helps them you know, think about the vocabulary. Um, and if we get to it, the Cartoon Olympics is another Keith Tota thing and we have a link to his blog spot. Um, but that can be a really fun thing to do with reading a story and the vocab. So there are just so many, oops, things that you can do. Um, these are the directions for the Cartoon Olympics, and we're going to share this um, Google Slides, right? So people should be able to- Nora, go ahead and, and talk about it. I think that's, we've got some time. Do we? Okay. Um, so again, it's the whiteboards. Um, and random.org, if you don't know about that, is such a great way to, it's just a quick online thing where you can randomize groups. You can put, you know, numbers one through five, and then you can just click and make your groups come up randomly. Um, so with this thing, I would put them in groups of three or four, right? I just have my desks in fours, and sometimes there are three students in that group. Um, and I have them share the whiteboard uh, because then I find, it, it's less stressful. Like it's less about one person's picture and everybody's contributing. And if you can give them a bunch of colors, it's even better. Um, and so then I would put a story up on the smart board and I would read through a few sentences and maybe we would talk about what's going on. Um, and then they would illustrate it. I would time it. Like you have two minutes to illustrate it. And the idea is you want them to put lots of labels in of the words pointing to things. Um, and getting a lot of detail in there. And then you've got maybe six groups and this is where the random comes in. So I roll the dice and oh, it's team five, they're the judges, but they don't know beforehand because otherwise they're not gonna draw. Um, and so everybody else brings their whiteboard up to the front of the room and then the judges come up and you give them a minute and they have to decide which one is the best based on how much information it is conveying about that little passage, you know, not the one that is the most artistic. Um, and then you just keep doing it again, but you randomize the judges table so that it's a different one each time, you know, and sometimes it might happen twice. Um, but I find that this can go really quickly and it's a really good, uh, like pre kind of a, maybe a reading thing. Like you've already done a pre-reading and then you might do this as the reading. Um, but I do like to have them draw a lot. And then. So past the sentence is something I completely lifted from Cambridge and adapted um, to fit the needs of my own students. So sometimes in an effort to community build, I'll chat with my students about whom are you listening to these days? Uh, what kind of music do you like? And then I'll go home and I'll put whomever my students happen to be listening to into a Latin exercise to help them. Um, so let's say they're learning about indirect statement within the context of their reading, and I want them to practice uh, the same kinds of words that they've used from the stories, except, you know, Ariana Grande makes an appearance or Beyonce. Beyonce, of course, I, she could make any appearance. So um, you just have the kids sit with, um, each kid has a piece of paper, um, it takes a lot of stress off. All you're doing is you just choose from column one um, and then you choose from column two 
and then when it says right fabra there's nothing to choose it's just me so um when i say fabra smith um they choose me and i think it also helps to take pressure off like direct any sort of attention to me and um and then they can get some laughs and giggle uh grins and giggles um because um i'm the butt of whatever joke happens to be so if beyonce um thinks that um fabra shaves the hair on her back then the kids roar with laughter it's like what you have hair on your back and it's like well you'll never know um and uh and they just go through choosing a word and then we um we say it out loud and a lot of them like they want to remember they haven't seen this word you know tondere they haven't seen tondeo since um unit one and so it's an opportunity to bring a little bit of something back and i think i even brought it back at one point um tonsor one of my kids was going to going through a Sweeney Todd uh, phase. And so it's like, well, you definitely need to know tonsor, a tonsorial um, musical. So Cambridge adaptations. Yeah, because there's a lot you can do, right? With just looking at the stuff in Cambridge and tweaking it your own way too, and, and asking the kids for ideas. So um, we've mentioned a lot about the power of illustration. Krashen talked about it as well. And um, I just provided a couple of different examples of how you can storyboard a story and have kids think about text in a way that they gain ownership. So the first one is you've chunked up the text. Um, when you chunk up that text for them, it becomes much more manageable. Those little bites tell them that, okay, I just have to focus on this little bit and this is what I'm going to draw. And I push kids through. Um, I will read it out loud so that they can hear what I'm emphasizing. I'll read it a couple of times. I only give them about 30 seconds to draw. We're just doing stick figures, we get to the point, and then um, we'll have students share. You could um, hold a document camera or your phone, or they could just hold it up in class if it's nice and dark enough, and um, they can explain what they drew. Um, and kids, love sharing their drawings. Uh, uh, like yesterday, my students were drawing animals and like, oh, look at my tiger. I have to show you my tiger. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that, that was a junior and a senior who were showing me their, their wild animals. And then the second part, um, you just take a Latin story and you ask students, read through a paragraph and give me a summary and give me a summary, a Latin caption that makes enough sense that um, it underscores what's going on in your picture. And so it helps them with sequencing, it helps them with uh, revisiting vocabulary, they're rereading without knowing that they're rereading. And, and then another way you can do these sorts of things digitally is GimKit has this draw it um, element. And um, so I did this one today um, and it was actually my seniors, but I was like, quick, you have to do this for me so I can get a picture. Um, so it's based on Grumio at Leo from stage four. And usually, and what I would do is I would actually give the students a list of the words because otherwise it could be anything and it's very hard for them to figure out. But essentially what happens is GimKit puts them in there and then it picks a random student. That student is given three word choices and then they start, they choose one and they start to illustrate it and the others have to guess. Um, and so there's a kind of a running like tab of their guesses on the side until they get it. So this one, I thought it was very good. Um, but that can be a lot of fun. It can go very quickly. And, and also you get a little list. You can pick specific students because I did have a student who was like, I want to draw. So it can either be random or you know a specific student, but it can be a lot of fun. Those eyes are really killer. I know, I know, you really <laughs> nailed it. And I really like supporting the GimKit guys because they were, you know, they were high school students when they developed this app. So, and now they're like future millionaires. Um, okay, so now we come to the important points to remember, um, which is to try to keep it simple and stupid. You know, that acronym KISS. Um, because I often make it more complicated than it should be. and you should never underestimate how simple it will, you know, how simple it needs to be sometimes for the kids. So keep, keep things simple, it'll make your life easier. Um, and then it's nice to focus on choice words, right? Like my students can never remember solere or contendere for some reason. Um, so it's nice to identify those words and then really focus on them, kind of the way I did with the puffy verbs. 
Um, and then this is just one of my beefs, but because a lot of them are of that age where they're convinced that they have learning styles, but those are really preferences. Um, and so I work very hard at convincing them like, no, you can also listen, you can write, you can move, like all of those things come together to help you learn the language well. Um, and then again, don't forget the, the teacher's manual. There's just so much stuff in there. It's, it's great bedtime reading. <laughs> chapter a day or something. yeah page a day, <laughs> page a day. it really like every time I look at it I'm like oh I hadn't thought of that so there's always something new it's it's a real um I think joy to go back after you've been teaching something and revisit what um ideas that you may have forgotten that's true too because yeah I keep forgetting stuff too and then it's kind of fresh and new so it's kind of nice like oh yeah I'll do I haven't done that in a while mm. So um, again, in the teacher's manual, you will see a host of pre-reading, during reading, and post-reading um, ways of looking at a story, of hearing a story, of predicting what's happening. And the activities that Nora and I have just gone through can fit in a variety of ways. Don't think that one activity is just pre-reading. Sometimes you can do it for pre-reading, and you can do it while you're reading, and you can do it again for post-reading. Um, so the, the looking back, um, asking students to do a quick summary um, so that uh, contextualizes what's happening in the coming story is particularly important. Um, the importance of illustrations, how valuable it is for students to hear a story read aloud. Who does not love to be read aloud to? Who doesn't love to hear a story? Um, and I, I've said this probably a thousand times, but a professor of mine once said, Sheridan Blau, he said, if the worst thing you do is read to your students, good. Um, and they certainly won't, um, won't hurt for you doing that. And then asking them to make predictions. And you can have them do it in a, a host of Latin English um, because it's really um, helping to stimulate what's happening um, before they get ready to read. So that's the pre-reading component. And then the during reading component again, um, on the next slide is, there it is. Um, just as a reminder, we're really helping students to think about vocabulary within the context of the story. So if we can help them by chunking things, if we can read aloud to them, if we can provide them with any sort of context clues. So again, like the close exercises, the storyboarding, um, any kind of opportunity to hear the language, um, it becomes so, so helpful while the students are reading. And then um, the second, I just gave you a tiny little sliver for the post reading or the, the third, I gave you a tiny oh. little sliver for the post reading slide um, okay. because oh, the wait. teachers, yeah. Shall I <laughs> go on? Shall I go on? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I was just gonna super quickly say too, like for the reading part, the, um, the glossary on the right is such a help and the students often don't look at it. And sometimes what I do is I will Xerox that page so that they can't be looking stuff up in the dictionary. And it kind of kind of compels them to figure it out from the context. Okay, here we go, the post reading. And that, and that fifth edition um, shift from the bottom vocabulary to the side and where it's almost next to whatever it is that they're reading, I think they're just following the line from left to right straight over. Um, so nice, a, a nice transition. So the consolidation piece, this kind of post reading, there are probably 20 different activities you could do. Don't think that you just have to do it at the end, whatever that means of the reading. You can still do a lot of these activities and I cut it off because there's so many. So go back and look through the first edition teacher's manual because it's going to give you all sorts of opportunities for reading and rereading and revisiting. Um, the same kinds of things that Nora and I suggested plus a host of others. Um, so finally, and I, I think that this is a really important point, encourage your kids to read widely and deeply um, outside of the class. Any sort of um, fiction that um, happens to pertain to the classical world, um, in any sort of historical fiction, anything that's nonfiction. I love it when kids come in and say, oh, look, I found something that uh, we were just talking about yesterday and maybe it was in um, 
a text about science or math. It's wonderful to hear that kind of connection. Just encourage them to open up their minds by reading English and Latin and whatever their um, heritage tongue might be so that they're able to make all sorts of intertextual connections. Yeah, actually, I had a student who's um, Iranian, and so his family speaks Farsi, and he made some connection the other day with that. He came in, so yeah, you're, there's a wealth of information there. It's very fun. Um, okay, so I mean, and so the reading method, I think we mentioned this right when we started, but it's really the, when they're in that story, they're not thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know that word. They're thinking, I want to find out what Grumio does next. What could it be? It's got to be this. And that's what really helps them figure out the vocabulary. Like they sort of forget themselves. Um, so the reading really drives the vocabulary um, as opposed to, you know, I was guilty of this, giving them all the vocabulary up front, making sure they knew it beforehand, and then going and reading. It's, it's, it's really better to do it the other way. Um, and I was just going to um, uplift what you were saying in the same way that um, I think there's a certain sense that we get as teachers that we've hit a checklist when we give our students a checklist. Um, but I think Krashen's qu quite right in his um, claim that it's not efficient. I mean, it, if it makes us feel better, but it's, they're not really learning anything and all they're doing is cramming and forgetting, then what's the point of what we've just done and we've wasted a lot of time when we could have been telling more stories, um, reading them aloud and sharing um, and getting hooked on um, what's going to happen next with the characters. And my student, my students are always clamoring for the vocab, like give me the list and I'll take the quiz. They love those, right? And, but I keep trying to explain to them, but it won't stick with you, but they feel like it does. So it's, yeah, it's important not to, it's really better not to do it that way. Um, and then all the other things that we talked about, you know, the Jenga thing, which is, you know, maybe you do once or twice a year, um, but they can really be calming. The calmer the students are, the less anxious. I know a lot of my students are coming into my classroom really anxious from all their math tests and their physics this. And so, you know, I try to make the Latin classroom and they often say it, it's like the peaceful, safe place for them in their day. Um, and that really opens it up for them to learn. Um, and then they like to compete too. So there are tons of things for that. And Blue Kit, Quizlet, Quizlet just came out with a new um, modality that I, I forget what it's called, but anyway, I'm checking it out. And then Text Debate, if you get a chance to check this out, I like it a lot because it's Latin to Latin. Um, so you can pour in texts and it's gonna give it back to them in different ways where they have to plug in the word, but um, you can do it in a way where there's no English. Um, I think that's pretty much it. That's what we have next. We included some useful links. Um, you know, we, we, there's Blue Kit, Gim Kit, the Blogspot, Textivate, and then don't forget about Magistrula. There are a lot of things you can do with that. And Magistrula also has a lacunae game. Well, it's kind of like a Mad Libs, and that can be a lot of fun too, because the teacher can choose what to drop out. And therefore, you can leave what you want them to focus on. So they can add the extra nouns, but then you've got them focusing on these different verb tenses and they can read each other's and it's very easy to use. I like that one a lot. If you're looking then, for, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, go ahead. Go. If you're looking for more opportunities to deepen your, um, why the heck am I doing uh, vocabulary in this way, whether that be to colleagues or students or parents or administration or just for yourself. Um, Krashen's The Power of Reading, I think, is a really helpful starter text. Kylene Beers, When Kids Can't Read, What Teachers Can Do. She's got a host of things that I didn't even bring up, um, one on logographs, so um, more opportunities to illustrate what's going on with vocabulary. She also talks about the importance of prefixes and suffixes and how to look at the nugget of a word um, so students see it's what our students do when they're doing derivative work. And Jeffrey Wilhelm's um, improving comprehension with think alouds. Think alouds um, are just a way of students when they read aloud, they actually just talk about what they're thinking as they're reading, like, huh, I don't know what that means. And actually saying that out loud to a partner is incredibly helpful because maybe the partner doesn't know, maybe the partner does. 
and maybe they can um, discuss it or come back and they can bring it up in a whole class discussion. Um, and that's a, a classic thing that not only um, English teachers do, but uh, people in theater, people in the sciences. So um, it's, I think, definitely interdisciplinary and super helpful.